Welcome to Acne Employment. We'll either find your job or we won't. Congratulations, you got the job. Welcome to the enrollment fee, thank you. Today in Ancient DOS Games, we're taking a look at Jones in the Fast Lane. So, this is a game I've known about for quite some time now, having watched multiple videos about it, yet never having played it myself. A usual sentiment is that it's reminiscent of the board game of life, which I actually do own and have played quite a number of times since childhood. Thus, now that I've played Jones in the Fast Lane, I can safely say that these two games don't play anything like each other. The thing is, the board game of life has very little strategy involved, and there's a handful of decisions you can make as you go through it, but for the most part, the game is up to random chance. It, the other thing too is that life is supposed to take place over the course of an entire lifetime, starting from fresh out of high school and ending at retirement, with a freaking forced marriage, not even joking, about a third of the way in. Jones in the Fast Lane is about taking a fast track to personal success over just a matter of weeks by meeting your own short-term goals. In fact, the rate at which you get raises, switch jobs, pass through the educational system in this game, it's about on par with tachyon particles, as in it shouldn't theoretically be possible to go that fast, and yet somehow is because game logic is best logic. Okay, really, I'm just kidding. This game's not that bad. It's kind of repetitive once you understand the inner workings and how to steer yourself towards a successful outcome, but there's absolutely some random chance thrown in as well. And just like with most board games, having other people to play against makes the experience even better. Though in my case, I had to play against the computer AI, which has some quirks that we're going to get into later. Or you can play solo too, which kind of just amounts to practice, since it's nearly impossible to lose at this game unless you play really badly. And there's some other technical weirdness I plan to get into later too, if you intend to play this on a modern computer. History. Jones in the Fast Lane was developed and released by Sierra Online in 1991, originally as a floppy disk release, but they quickly produced a CD-ROM version for release in 1992, with a whole bunch of speech added to the game. The CD-ROM version happens to be the one I'm playing, and most people familiar with this game probably have that version of it. It's a 0-4 player board game. Yes, you can actually set it up to watch the computer play in a demo mode using the game's AI, though obviously you're probably going to want to actually play it yourself. The video support varies depending on if you have the floppy release or the CD release. The floppy release includes EGA 16 color, Tandy 16 color, MCGA 256 color, and VGA 256 color support, all running at 320 by 200 resolution. But the CD release only leaves the VGA support intact. And as for audio devices, I don't know how many the floppy disk release supports, but the CD release supports quite a number of them, given that it has both music, sound effects, and CD audio based speech included. As for its current release date, it's still commercial and unfortunately extremely difficult to acquire, which is kind of unusual seeing as a fairly large number of Sierra games have ended up on GOG.com, but this is not one of them, at least not at the time of making this video. If and when it's added to GOG, I'll post the link in the video description. As of right now though, even finding it on places like eBay is hard. Based on what little info I was able to figure out, copies of this game tend to run for between $30 and $40 for the CD-ROM version, but I have no idea if that's just for the media or if that's including things like the box and manuals and such. And as for the floppy disk version, <laughs> I couldn't find any info on that one, let alone people selling it. So yeah, if you're looking to seek out a copy of this, prepare to spend a lot of time scrounging for it. Before you start playing the game, there's a few things you need to set up. You first select your character's appearance from one of four, then select your goals. And this is actually quite the point of interest in that you're basically able to assign what it will take for you to win the game, and a number is assigned to this as well to indicate the overall difficulty. The more goal points it takes for you to win, the more difficult it'll be to reach that. Actually, this already brings up a question asked by one of my Patreon supporters, Chloe Kitty, who wondered, 
what the point of buying items are, or, and this is the big one, are there any options for character customization? Well, buying items primarily follows into the happiness goal I'm about to talk about, as well as the education goal to a lesser extent. While as for character customization, there's unfortunately no options for that. You pick a character who comes with a particular color of marble as their playing piece for the board, and that's it. But yeah, there's four goals you need to work towards through the course of the game. Wealth, happiness, education, and career. You get wealth points simply by having money itself, or invested money. Happiness comes primarily from buying things. Yes, you literally buy your happiness in this game. Although you can also raise happiness more subtly by doing things like relaxing at home or eating more expensive fast food. Education comes both from completing courses at the university, but also from acquiring goods which have educational value, while career simply comes down to doing work and getting better, higher paying jobs. In fact, through all my runs through this game, I found career to be the easiest goal to reach and wealth to be the hardest, but it really does depend on how you play. You then choose if you want to go up against Jones or not, Jones being the game's AI character. When you do decide to play against Jones, you're able to set his skill level as well. And unfortunately, Jones' AI suffers from the same issues as the AI in Wacky Wheels, in that you essentially have three selections. Take it easy, play fair, or go for broke, which are supposed to equate to easy, normal, and hard. But the better description of these skill levels would be really easy, easy, and freaking impossible. Seriously, so long as you're playing at least somewhat competently, Jones does not pose a challenge on the easiest setting, and only a minor challenge on the normal setting. But on the third setting, Jones makes zero mistakes and does everything flawlessly. Plus, we'll always choose a quantity of goal points 40 less than whoever's is the lowest. So at that point, it's literally 100% luck if you win or not. And that's presuming you play flawlessly too. Suffice to say, this is way better played against actual people instead of the AI. Not to mention, you can only have one AI player at a time. You can't set any of the other characters to be AI controlled. Each player starts the game renting a super cheap apartment, unemployed, with $200 of cash in hand. When your turn comes up, you're given an amount of time points to spend moving around the board and performing activities, with each turn equating to about a week. Thus, why certain things seem to cost more than you'd think they should like the food at the Monolith Burger, which is expensive because you're technically paying for a whole week's worth. On the very first turn, the most important thing to do is get a job, because $200 is not going to last long. Almost every space on the board equates to a location that you can be employed at, and the kinds of jobs available at each of them vary considerably. Internally, the game is tracking what kinds of jobs you have experience with and what kinds of jobs your education qualifies you for. Well, at the start, you're pretty much consigned to flipping burgers or cleaning toilets, but it's important to look at all the openings because the wages vary considerably between each. Now, if you try to get hired for something and aren't accepted, the audio cue will tell you if it's because of a lack of experience, a lack of education, or if there's simply no openings, which doesn't necessarily mean you're qualified, just that the game isn't allowing that job to be accepted for that turn. You're actually going to want to return to the employment center frequently because the wages available can change every turn, and so long as you're actually going to work and doing your job a little every turn, you can either rise the ranks or potentially apply for the same position you already have, but at a higher wage. Just make sure you don't go up the ranks too quickly. More on that later. Every turn also requires you to feed yourself somehow. Now you have two options for this, either eating from the Monolith Burger or buying groceries from Black's Market. Now until you get much later in the game, it's best to just eat a diet of fries since that's the cheapest food option. Oh sure, buying groceries is even cheaper, but you have to store those groceries in your apartment, which means you need a fridge or a freezer. And I'm not entirely certain, but I think you also need a means to cook food if you only have a freezer and not a fridge such as a stove or a microwave. Buying groceries without a means to store them means they're going to spoil and leave you hungry, so don't do that. Actually, this would be a good time to bring up that it doesn't matter how you go about attaining your personal goals, just that you eventually do. Now, this isn't The Sims. You aren't capable of going negative with any of your goals, and with the exception of wealth, which will fluctuate, your goals almost never lose any points. So it's best to wait on certain things until the time is right to go for them. Especially since you start the game in the low-cost housing apartments, where thefts happen routinely. 
Thus, to avoid having your stuff stolen, you need a security apartment at first. And if your stuff does get stolen, you can often find it for sale at the pawn shop for cheap, so getting it back isn't as big a hassle as first obtaining it. But then why go through all that in the first place? As you progress through the turns, some seemingly random events may occur, though they're not as random as you might think. And one of the first ones which comes up early on is needing new clothes. If you fail to obtain new clothes that same turn, you'll start the next turn wearing a barrel because your clothes will rip and become unwearable. While wearing a barrel, you're not able to work because you're not properly dressed for work. This brings up the pertinent point that each job in the game requires a certain level of attire, either casual, dress, or business. And interestingly enough, not many jobs require dress attire as the minimum. Most are either good with casual or absolutely require business clothes. The other pertinent point though is that higher quality clothes also last longer and they don't need to be replaced as often. So really, the instant you can afford better than casual, go for it. However, getting better, higher paying jobs also requires education. And amazingly, enrolling in the university in this game is one of the least expensive things you can do, unlike in real life. But I guess that's primarily to stay on point with the balance of the game. You're then able to put your education towards a particular field of study, which in turn unlocks access to particular jobs. Now, as you complete an area of study, other areas of study may open up for future enrollment. Now, other locations on the map provide other services as well. The bank allows you to deposit money as well as invest in stocks, though the investment system is... uh... Slow. The trick with the bank, though, is that you have a chance of having your wallet stolen whenever you leave the bank, which is super annoying to say the least. Ideally, you'd want to avoid it entirely, but I'm pretty sure you run other risks by keeping all your money in your pockets instead. When it comes to buying stuff to make your character happy, you have two locations you can visit, Z-Mart and Socket City. Z-Mart is much cheaper to buy from than Socket City, but there's a couple caveats. The first is that Z-Mart's stock is randomized every turn, and so they may not have what you want. The second is that stuff bought from Z-Mart will break down much more easily, requiring money to be spent to fix them. The one advantage though is that Z-Mart will routinely carry items which further your educational goals instead of your happiness goals, like atlases and encyclopedias. The only item Socket City has which can do that is a computer, and that's pretty much the most expensive thing you can purchase in this entire game. The last thing to mention, and something which can greatly affect the course of any run through the game, are the random events. Now, as you progress through the game, there's a handful of things being tracked in the background, which randomly adjust across every turn, and even between players. But sometimes a major event occurs, which can throw things really out of whack. Now, this includes values for stuff like unemployment, inflation levels, probably a number of other things that I'm not even aware of, and all of this in turn affects how high the wages offered are for new jobs or raises, as well as how expensive everything is. Now, usually these fluctuate in tandem, but occasionally they'll be out of sync, and that's when things can get weird. For instance, with the right combination of events, it's possible for the game to get into a state where wages are super low, while the cost of living is super high. And if this happens, it becomes incredibly difficult to reach pretty much any level of wealth. And another potential hiccup is if unemployment skyrockets. This not only puts you out of a job immediately, but you'll find a lot of jobs won't have any openings, so getting a new job can be tricky, especially if you haven't been keeping up with your education. Now you can get a loan from the bank, but you're only allowed one loan at a time, and it's only for a paltry $200, which can be enough to slowly get you back on track, but if you're behind on rent and can't find a job, you're probably screwed. All things said, I found a typical run through this game with perfectly average goal points and not making too many mistakes takes around 30 weeks to complete, with my best run taking 28 weeks. So that should give you a frame of reference in terms of how well you're doing when going for evened out goals. But adjusting the goals can really change the course of the game, and it's also a good way to handicap better players when playing the game with multiple people. Overall, Jones in the Fast Lane is fun the first few times you play, but it gets rote and routine pretty quickly if you're not playing against other people. Well, this is absolutely a great game for multiplayer though, so if you can find some other people to play this against, I'd highly recommend it. It's just too bad it's so hard to find legit copies nowadays. Now hopefully we see this one pop up on GOG at some point. In fact, I'd be very surprised if it never did, given GOG's history and success with other Sierra titles. 
As a single player game though, you're probably going to lose interest pretty quickly, but it's still worth a play at least a couple times if you've never played it before and have any interest at all in life simulation games or board games. If those kinds of games aren't your cup of tea though, then this game is not really going to provide anything special for you. Okay, so once you get this game installed properly, all you have to do is leave Cycle Set to Auto and the game will run fine. But actually getting the CD copy of the game working at all can be a bit finicky, and unfortunately, it's because of how the game handles the speech. See, all of the speech in the game is cobbled together as a single 38 minute long audio track, with the game seeking to specific time codes for playing back particular points of dialogue. And this audio track was also assembled onto the disc in a very unusual way, which confused the heck out of my image burning software. Well, even though it supposedly ripped a proper CD image, my attempts to mount it in DOSBox failed. And I tried running the game with the CD itself mounted, and while this did work, the lag introduced from all the seeking was unbearable. One of the drawbacks of having a 48 speed CD drive when trying to play a game designed for single and double speed drives is that seek times are often way worse because of all the spin up, spin down, and seek ahead which goes on with a modern drive. Now, thankfully, there's a workaround, but even this has potential shortcomings. If you go online to sierrahelp.com, you can find a whole bunch of specialized installers designed to make it easier to get old Sierra games working on modern systems. Now, a custom installer available here for Jones in the Fast Lane performs a proper install, which also does a rip of the audio track into AUG format and sets up a sort of faux CD image with just this audio track mounted instead of any of the game data as the game never actually accesses beyond its current working directory when it's looking for the game data. The trouble, however, is that when I first tried playing the game installed in this way, because of how the CD audio is recorded, the audio track was desynced with the intended time codes the game was trying to seek to. Now, this may simply be a problem with my specific CD, but I imagine other people have the exact same CD, or heck, maybe everyone does. But in my case, to fix this problem, I had to open the AUG file that was generated with Audacity and cut out the first 27,180 samples of data, which at a 44100Hz sample rate equates to approximately the first 0.6163 seconds, which is all garbage data anyways. Once I did this, the speech worked flawlessly. So if you're intending to run your own copy through DOSBox, be prepared to do this exact same edit with your own audio editor after running the custom installer. Also keep in mind that the custom installer sets a cycles rate of 8000 in DOSBox, which is entirely unnecessary, but it does speed up the gameplay a bit if you prefer playing the game that way. But then that also makes it harder to recover from misclicks on the map since everything's going by faster. Personally, I prefer just leaving it set to auto because everything goes at a much slower pace, but not too slow. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Episode 245 will be next Saturday on the 18th, and we'll be taking a look at what's arguably considered to be the worst digital pinball game ever made. Suffice to say, I'm reserving judgment until I actually play it myself. But in any case, if you think you know which game it could be, then be sure to send your guests to adg at pixelships.com, and make sure to stay tuned because this next episode is also going to include an unboxing of a sealed copy of the game. Or at least presumably sealed. Jury's still out on that one, so we're going to investigate it together. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small sample, you guys.